Uh, we're delighted to have you here for this uh, fall panel lecture. We're also delighted to have uh, Dr. Sherry Richard here from the Utah Museum of Natural History. Uh, I've asked Dr. Duke Rogers, the uh, curator of the Animal Collection of the Mean Life Science Museum, uh, and also professor of biology, uh, to introduce Dr. Richard. We'd like to give, again, special thanks to the Tanner family uh, provided an endowment that generates spendable money that allows us to do this way. <laughs> Philippine Islands, 
the geology and geography, and that sort of sets the stage for why this place has such uh, amazing, unique mammals. A little bit about the climate of the Philippines and the types of habitat that are there, some other aspects of, of the physical environment that I think are extremely relevant to the natural history of the mammals and other organisms there, and uh, also tell us something about um, conservation challenges. Then I'll go through and talk, or then I'll talk about uh, biodiversity, the, the concept of biodiversity, and endemism. These are two things that are completely relevant to the fauna of the Philippines. Um, an overview of some of the more interesting taxa, interesting species of mammals uh, in the Philippines, and then I'll finish on conservation issues. But before I do any of that, uh, rather than waiting until the end of a talk, I feel it's, it's important to make acknowledgments up front. Um, the gentleman on the right, Larry Haney, is the guy who got me interested in Philippine mammals or going to the Philippines and gave me the opportunity to do so. Um, he is the leader of this grand project which we call the Philippine Mammal Project. Um, and the gentleman on the left is Danilo Valente, Danny Valente, he's a Filipino. Both of these men are at Field Museum in Chicago. One of the reasons why I take regular train trips between Salt Lake City and Chicago. I just got back from one last week. Um, so, if we were to look at a relief map of the world, this is what the Philippines look like. They look like a very discreet archipelago. Does this have a, I guess it doesn't have a pointer on it. Anyway, up here you can see the Philippines, they're labeled. Um, but that's a little bit misleading. It really isn't such a discrete uh, archipelago that's sort of stationary um, north of Borneo and south of, of Taiwan. Um, if, you're, if you were to strip away, there's, there's the Philippines, if you were to strip away the ocean and it, be able to look at the sort of physical foundation um, uh, underneath, underneath the, the ocean, you would see that it's geologically very complex. The Philippines lie just east of the continental shelf, the Sunda shelf, the Asian shelf, shelf. Um, and they're in deep water. Uh, they're, they're oceanic islands. They're surrounded, or on either side, they're bracketed by deep water trenches, some of the deepest um, areas in, in the world, the, uh, the Philippine Trench and the, uh, and the uh, Manila Trench. Um, now, if we were to roll, this is that picture, that same picture. I'm going to show you this picture and others. Uh, there are maps that were developed by Robert Hall, who's a, a paleogeologist at the University of London. And he uses um, radiometric dating to age rocks in the Philippines and elsewhere. And also paleomagnetic, uh, uh, I don't really know what it is, paleomagnetism to understand the position of those rocks relative to uh, other, other areas of the Earth, and then reconstruct where these blocks of rock were in the past. So if we go back to the mid-Eocene, 50 million years ago, there aren't very many rocks from the Philippines at that time, but they're shown in red. And you can see that they extend all the way from um, where Formosa, or Taiwan, is up near China down to where New Guinea is now. And so far from being a discrete um, uh, archipelago, this thing had a, had a wild prehistory. So now I'm going to run this forward. You'll see other areas of red coming up as the, as the uh, rocks become available and as their positions are known. And this will automatically go forward in time. And you see that things are beginning to coalesce. And by 15 million years ago, which was the middle of the Miocene, uh, well into the age of mammals, uh, this was the period of time when the first above water land was present in the Philippines and has been present ever since. So areas of northern Luzon, which are shown in the large, the large red blob up towards the top, uh, were already above the water and they were available for colonization by land mammals. Back. So I've got there. And we'll just move this up again to the present time. 
All right, this, this complex geological history means that these islands are made up of a ground area or a, of a surface area that is, has a very different geological signal. Okay, so some of the areas, like the, the mountain ranges, are, are old, very ancient metamorphic rocks. Other areas are areas of alluvium that are very, very recent, okay, just uh, in, in the last few million years. And then the triangles represent volcanoes, which are a big component of the Philippine uh, geology. Uh, again, looking at a map of the northern Philippines, uh, you can see the Manila Trench to the, uh, to the uh, west, that's west, right, and the Philippine Trench to the east. These are the subduction zones, areas where the, um, the crust of the oceanic uh, slab, um, uh, the crust from, from that tectonic plate is being um, forced down into the mantle. Okay? And during that process, uh, water-laden sediments that are on the, uh, the oceanic sediments that are on that piece of crust, as they get driven down into the mantle, they create, um, so there's the ocean trench, there's the direction of movement for the subducting slab, and they create magma. And that magma comes up in the form of volcanoes. So the volcanic arches, the volcanic arcs that, uh, that we see in various parts of the Pacific, along the Pacific Rim, the Rim of Fire, are due to these subduction zones that are associated with these, with these trench, trenches. Now, the interesting thing about the Philippines is that this is actually occurring in two separate areas on either side of, of the archipelago. And now we're just focusing in the northern island of Luzon. And much of what I say tonight is going to be uh, focused on Luzon. Anyway, the western volcanic zone and the eastern volcanic zone. And there are active volcanoes on, on both sides of Luzon. And they're shown here. And they are active. Okay, these are all relatively recent uh, volcanic eruptions. The oldest one is Mount Pahal, um, uh, the bottom left. And that's 1977. Um, the most recent one is on my own, which periodically blows its top, but it, it generally is not explosive. It is uh, dense lava. But Mount Pinatubo, up on the left, you've probably all heard about that. In 1981, um, it erupted with great loss of life and property, and uh, not a little bit of impact on, on the wildlife. We'll talk more about that as we go along. Well, in addition to volcanism, of course, there, is, there are earthquakes. There's a lot of seismic activity throughout the Philippine archipelago. The red line that runs down from northern Luzon all the way down to the southern, through the southern island of Mindanao is, uh, marks the, the, uh, the Philippine vault, uh, vault complex. And on this, or across this line, on the uh, eastern side, things are moving forward, moving upward. And on the western side, things are moving down. So this represents a, a slip fall. Okay. Uh, and there are many, many volcanoes. Earth volcanoes. There are many, many earthquakes along this. This is just showing earthquakes that are significant, of greater than 5.5 magnitude on the Richter scale since 1900. And there are more than you can possibly count. Um, of course, the damage associated with, with earthquake activity is very great, ripping apart surface fissures, um, uh, loss of, of, of property and life in cities, and then also uh, in, the, in the countryside, causing, in mountainous areas, causing landslips and, and earth slides and uh, things of that sort. Uh, all of these things have, have uh, consequences for wildlife and their habitat. So with all this geological activity, this complex um, uh, development of the islands, you have also the complex development of topography. The uh, Philippines is a very mountainous country. Um, and the interesting thing about mountains uh, is, that, is that there are predictable things that happen as you move upslope from the lowlands to the highlands in a mountain, in a mountain uh, anywhere in the world. Things get cooler and wetter as you move up slope because of the laws of physics. Air cools as it, as it, goes, as, as you, as it moves higher. As it cools, its ability to hold moisture decreases, so you have more precipitation. 
So things are dry, relatively dry in the lowlands and relatively wet in the mountains. Um, there is little seasonal variation in temperature in the tropics, unlike the temperate region. This is the, the biggest difference. Uh, there's more variation from night to day, any time of the year, than there is between the extremes, the summer extremes and the winter extremes, if you can even call them that. Um, so very little seasonal variation in temperature. The result is that there's great stability across these elevational zones, and there's the, the development of different kinds of habitat that are very characteristic. Um, of these different zones and that are highly adapted to, to the physical conditions of the local climate. And these habitats are extremely stable over very, very long time periods. In fact, geological time periods. Um, this is what some of the elevation looks like. Lowland forest is your typical idea of what a jungle looks like, where you have uh, tall stature trees and canopy, uh, sparse ground cover on the forest floor uh, and intervening layers of, of multi-layered -can multi canopy in between. Lots of uh, diversity in the tree species, um, vines, lots of other sorts of things growing in, in the forest. Um, as you move up slope, you get to montane forests, which are the mid-elevation forests, which have fewer uh, kinds of trees, um, simpler uh, type of, of habitat uh, or physical structure to the forest. And up at the highest elevation, you have these dwarfed trees. They look more like something you would see in the Pacific Northwest of North America. Um, they, they're, it's called, it's a cloud forest. In the Philippines, they refer to them as mossy forests because the trees are covered with moss. The ground surface is covered with moss. Epiphytic plants that grow on the trees themselves not just moss, but also uh, orchids, ferns, um, pitcher plants, a whole variety of things, an ecosystem in the air, essentially. Well, one other aspect of climate that I want to touch on are climate extremes, and particularly the cyclonic storms, which in Southeast Asia are called typhoons. Same thing as a hurricane. Um, this map shows uh, the, the storm paths of, her, of, of typhoons through the Philippine archipelago just over the last uh, five-year period, from 2009 to 2013, well, over a five-year period. Uh, 2013 was a very significant year because it was that year in which the super typhoon Haiyan, which was also called um, uh, Yolando it was, uh, in, in, the, in the Philippines, or Yolanda, um, came through in, December, in November 2013. This is an aerial uh, satellite photograph of it as it was approaching the Philippine archipelago. When it made landfall in the archipelago, it had the highest recorded wind speed of any tropical storm anywhere in the world. Set a record. And you may remember uh, hearing about the, the great loss of life in the Visayan Islands uh, in, in the central Philippines that were hit when this, when this storm went through. Uh, again, uh, typhoons have, have uh, a big impact on, on forest environments and, and natural habitats as well. There is a kind of forest in um, the typhoon belt of Southeast Asia that's known as a storm forest. It's a subclimax forest means it's a forest that is never really allowed to develop its full potential uh, as a mature tropical forest because it's constantly being knocked back by these powerful storms. So we're going to go back in, in time a little bit more and I'm going to tell you a little bit about Pleistocene prehistory and Pleistocene geography. So this is a sort of quasi aerial or satellite image of what the world looks like now. Um, uh, with the extent of polar ice, of course, is one of these projections that makes the, the poles look much more substantial than they are in, in actuality. But um, this is what things look like now. This is what they looked like uh, 20 to 30,000 uh, years ago during the height of the last glacial epoch. You see the development of, of big continental glaciers in the northern hemisphere. 
Um, areas where in, in North America where the ice was actually a kilometer thick or more. Okay, so lots of the world's water budget was tied up in these big glaciers, in these ice packs. Um, water obviously came from somewhere, it came from the ocean, ultimately. And as a result of that, the, um, the sea level was much lower than it is now. And I'm just going to work this back and take a look at Southeast Asia, uh, take a look at, at uh, Florida, and you can see the, the differences in the extent of the land. Okay, we'll focus in on Southeast Asia here, and we'll see the current water depth and, and the islands, the current islands in green, and the, and the, uh, the shallow water shown by light blue represent areas of the continental shelf, which in this part of, of the Asian shelf is, is, is known as uh, the Sunda shelf. And during the various glacial cycles, all of this was dry land. And my geographers refer to it as Sunda land. You can see that during this time, the Malay Peninsula, which is right underneath Sunda land, um, the island of um, of Sumatra, of Borneo, and actually one of the island groups, Palawan, in the Philippines were all encompassed within Sundaland. Um, and I'll get ahead of myself a little bit and tell you that the animals and the plants that are present in Sundaland all uh, are, are fairly uniform. I mean, there are some differences island to island, but they're clearly Sundaland biota. Okay, they, they, they're, they're related to one another. Okay, so this is focusing on Pleistocene geography in, in the Philippines. The dark green shows you the, uh, the extent of the existing islands. And the lighter green shows you what it would have looked like 20,000 years ago uh, when sea level was about 170 meters below what it is now. Okay, so there were many of these areas that were combined into, into Pleistocene islands. Um, the northern island, we refer to as Greater Luzon. The big southern island, we refer to Greater Mindanao, Greater Palawan, and, and these other islands. Even some of the smaller islands were much larger. But the thing to remember is that there were big, there were deep water channels, much deeper than the, 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 uh, that could have been exposed during the uh, Pleistocene epoch. That, that separated these greater islands, these Pleistocene islands. So they remained separate during this time. Okay, now I'm going to say a little bit about endemism. We all know, we all think about biodiversity is simply the diversity of life. You can measure that in various ways. Endemism is one aspect of biodiversity. It has to do with the distribution of, of, of organisms. And when we say an animal or a, a, a plant species is endemic, it means it has a restricted distribution. Now, of course, at some level, everything has a restricted distribution. Uh, so we, when we talk about endemism when we're talking about a biogeographic area. And I'm going to illustrate this to you through some comparisons and try to bring it home, OK, in a way that you'll understand it, uh, for those of you who this may be unfamiliar. So we're going to look at three three areas. Okay, we're going to look at Utah, the Philippines. This talks about the Philippines and Vietnam, another Asian country. The land area of these things they, they increase from Utah to Vietnam, but it's still no more than a, a fifty percent increase. Okay, uh, Vietnam is fifty percent larger than than Utah. Those are the land areas. The native land mammals, that is, native things that, that are supposed to be there, that have always been there, not things that were introduced, are shown here. Uh, 134 species in, um, in Utah. Duke, is that right? It sounded right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then more in the Philippines and more in Vietnam. Actually, you know, that's, that's reasonable given the fact that uh, these are, those areas are slightly larger and also they're tropical more species in the province. Okay, now we're going to look at endemic mammals, mammals that are restricted to these areas. Uh, there is one endemic mammal in Utah. It's the Utah prairie dog. You either love it or hate it. I love it. 
But uh, at any rate, that yellow circle there shows you uh, where they occur. In fact, it encompasses the historic range of the Utah prairie dog, as far as we know. Um, so it's, it's a true endemic. But it's less than 1% of, of all of the, of the mammals in the state. Vietnam has 12 endemic mammals. Well, that's pretty good. That's much better. Um, but it's still only 5% of all the animals that are, uh, or all the mammals that are in, uh, in Vietnam. How about the Philippines? The Philippines have 154 endemic mammals. That means they occur only in the Philippines. That's 70% of all their mammal fauna, other than marine mammals, we're not counting those, are endemic to the islands. And when you look deeper on this, it's even more, the endemism is even more complex. Greater Luzon, okay, which is this area that I've outlined in red, 65 of the 72 native species, 90%, are in debt. If you look at the uh, southern island of Greater Mindanao, or that, that model region, 27 of 32, or 84 percent of the mammals are in debt. And this number is definitely going to rise because there hasn't been anything near the same amount of, of detailed work that's been done in, uh, in, in Mindanao as there has been on Luzon. Even these smaller islands, including the smallest that, that, that have just uh, nine species uh, of, uh, of native mammals, they still have relatively high levels of endemism. So the separate regions have very unique faunas. Those unique faunas are, the uniqueness is driven by the fact that they are endemic. They hold endemic mammals that occur nowhere else. Another aspect of, of diversity and endemism is driven by, again, by the elevational relief. And the, the large islands of, of Luzon and Mindanao, present-day Luzon and present-day Mindanao, are shown here. The black areas or the dark areas represent areas of highland elevation. And remember, I told you that in the tropics, these high areas are islands within islands. They're stable, these zonal, zonal differences up in elevation are stable over time. So animals that are adapted to these, type, these, these high elevation peaks are isolated from other such places for thousands of years. And in fact, many of them have endemic mammals themselves on the mountaintops. So we haven't always known everything we know now about the mammals of the Philippines, so I'm going to walk you through a little bit of mammalogical history. Um, the Philippines were a Spanish colony up until uh, the Spanish-American War, when they became an American colony. Right before the Spanish-American War occurred, there was a British biologist, a British field naturalist, who went to northern Luzon, and he discovered a number of new species. It was very surprising. And those were the first endemics that were known from, from northern Luzon. These are some of the pictures of them. Um, these are the things that I saw in that early book that got me very interested in, um, in mammals of the Philippines. Mount Dada was the place where most of them came from. One single mountain in northern Luzon. All right, um, over the years, there was subsequent work done, and uh, mostly by American biologists. Um, and they, they didn't roam very widely on Blue's Island, Luzon Island. We're only talking about Luzon here, by the way. Remember, remember to tell you that. And by 2000, there were some 25 mammals known. This is mammals uh, uh, other than bats. Okay, so land mammals other than bats. Um, and we thought that this was, 2000 was just before we started, uh, our group started surveying uh, mammals of Luzon in, in detail. Um, and we thought maybe we'd find a few more that would continue up with this relatively modest slope. What we found was that over a period of, of 14 years, we doubled the number of mammals known from Luzon. Again, because we, we realized that the 
island areas that were separated one from the other might contain unique species. And that certainly was the case. Okay, now I'm going to actually talk about, show you some pictures of, of mammals from the Philippines. Um, the giant pine flying foxes. The Philippines is home to two species of giant fruit bats. Uh, they're referred to as flying foxes. You can see their heads look sort of dog-like. Um, both of these fly for the position of largest bat in the world. The one on the left, the giant flying fox, Taropus vampirus, has the broadest wingspan. The one on the right, the golden crowned flying fox, which is an endemic species, only found in the Philippines, weighs more than any other bat. So they are the largest bats. How large are they? They're as big as eagles. The largest bats in the world. And by the way, the largest eagle is also found in the Philippines. The Philippine eagle. So, little island archipelago that has some extremes. Some of the Philippine bats, there's a great variety of Philippine bats, and I can only show you a few of them. Um, there are some very colorful ones here. This is the smallest bat in the Philippines. It used to be thought that maybe it was the smallest bat in the world. It's the lesser bamboo bat. And that's somebody's index finger, and that's an adult bat sitting on, on his finger. Um, there is a slightly smaller bat from mainland Southeast Asia called the bumblebee bat, which is, which is a little bit smaller. Um, here's some uh, sort of a grab bag of odd-looking bats. The uh, ghost bat on the left has giant ears. It's, uh, it feeds mostly on lizards and small mammals. They're really cool. They're really cool bats. It made a spasmus the name that's placed on it, and it's considered a widespread species. But I carry a type of these when I was in the Philippines the uh, first year that I was there and discovered that it has an entirely different karyotype than the ones from mainland Asia. So even though the species is widespread, the one that's in the Philippines is probably a cryptic species. And I haven't worked on it, and nobody, nobody else has. So it has been named as a new species, but it probably is. Um, some of these others are Philippine endemics, others are widespread. One on the bottom is the naked three-tailed bat. It's one of the oddest bats in the world. It doesn't have uh, much hair on it at all, uh, and it's, it's really cool. Um, these are some of the insectivores in the Philippines. Uh, there are a few shrews that are present in the Philippines, but they didn't get there until fairly late um, in, in history. Um, and there really isn't a great diversity of them. They're very much like the shrews that we have in the western United States. They're in a different section of that same family. On the right, the Mindanao gimner is actually a relative of the hedgehog, and it's only found in Mindanao. Very odd little beast. Here's an even odder animal, um, the Philippine flying lemur. Doesn't fly, and it's not a lemur. It flies. It's sort of like a like a big uh, flying or a big flying squirrel. Yeah, it also doesn't fly. It's a gliding mammal. It uh, is a member of the order Dermoptera, and it's only one of two species in that order. The other one is found in mainland. Um, Asia, and, and, that, and this one is restricted to the Mindanao faunal region, the southern faunal region of, of the Philippines. Really cool. Um, another weird Philippine mammal is the pangolin, the Philippine pangolin. This one is uh, endemic to the island of uh, Palawan, which again was one of the islands that was part of the Sunda shell, but it was separate enough for enough of its history that this species developed in isolation there. They're sometimes called scaly anteaters. Um, these are three Philippine primates. Uh, the one on the left is the Philippine tarsier. There used to be thought to be only one species in the Philippines. There's now another one known from another island uh, that's genetically uh, distinct. Um, at any rate, they're endemic to the Mindanao fauna region. The slow loris on the right is found on Palawan, but it's found on many of the other islands on the Sunda shelf. So it's not endemic uh, to the Philippines, but it's, it is a native. Um, the long-tailed macaque, Macaca fascicularis, is a widespread species. For years, it was thought to have been uh, a native mammal in uh, to 
throughout the Philippine archipelago, it occurs on virtually every island. And that should have been a giveaway that it probably might, might not have been a native species. There's very little genetic differentiation between Philippine populations and populations elsewhere in Asia. It's almost certain, there's no direct evidence, but it's almost certain that it was introduced by people. Prehistorically, but that it was introduced by people. Um, here are some Philippine ungulates. The interesting thing about the Philippine, Philippine islands is that most of the mammals there are very small, um, which is great if you're a small mammal biologist like me. But there are also some, some interesting larger species. And actually, there are some extinct mammals. That there were elephants there, and there were some other things that were very large that went extinct uh, at the end of the Pleistocene, beginning of the Holocene. Um, but anyway, rate, tamarau is a wild relative of the Asian water buffalo. Um, it's only found now, it's only found on the island of, of Mindoro, which is a relatively small island east of, of, uh, of Luzon, uh, or west of Luzon, excuse me. In the center are two species that are endemic to the Visayan Islands in the central portion of the Philippines, the Visayan deer, which is endemic to Negros and Panay, and the Visayan warty pig, uh, which is also uh, endemic to that same region. Elsewhere in the Philippines, there are other species of deer and pig that are more widespread, but they are different species. They are separate species. Uh, Philippine carnivores. There are very few kinds of carnivores in the oceanic portion of the Philippines. Uh, there are two that are very widespread. The Malayan civet and the Asian palm civet. The jury's still out on this, but these two may have actually been introduced by people prehistorically. The genetic studies haven't been done to verify that, but we strongly suspect that may be the case. The leopard cat, uh, which is found only uh, on the island of, of Negros Cebu in, uh, in the Philippines, um, we used to think that that was, that was introduced as well. It's a widespread Asian species. It goes all the way over to India. But genetic evidence actually shows that it may have gotten there naturally before people had anything to do with, with moving things around. So it may be a distinct, not a distinct species, but a distinct population that's native there. So now we get to the rodents. Okay, they're the really cool things. Um, mainly because there's been so much action by rodents in the Philippines. Uh, so this is a, a phylogenetic diagram, a cladogram, that shows the relationships of one of the endemic groups that have evolved throughout the archipelago. Um, the cloud rats or tree rats, that we, we refer to them as. Um, and when I say rat, um, it, it makes me feel good. But most people think of rat, they, they use it as a pejorative term. So, but I'm not using it. These things you'll see don't look very much like the kinds of rats that crawl out of sewers. The important thing about, about this group is that they arrived in the Philippines as near as we can tell from molecular clock stuff, and yeah, I know that's all you know, hard to deal with, but they probably arrived in the Philippines almost as soon as there was dry land ready to receive them in, in northern, northern Luzon. And in fact, they are the most ancient group of of living murid rodents, murids being the family muridae, the old world rats and mice. They are the basal group for that whole thing. They're the oldest ones. Their old, they're nearest relatives that they evolved from or that they came from from Asia, they went extinct on Asia, the mainland Asia, but they're still in the Philippines. This is what some of them look like. Uh, uh, the genus, the giant cloud rats are in two genera, Floamese and Craterones. They're at separate points on that, on that tree. And Flomies coming on is the world's largest mirrored rodent. It weighs as much as a cat. It's not, the, it's not the largest rodent. It doesn't weigh as much as a beaver or a capybara or any of those things, but uh, it's the largest mirrored rodent. Um, interestingly enough, a close relative of the giant cloud rats is the pygmy tree rats, or pygmy tree mice, or whatever you want to call them. Um, and these are the, this is the smallest Philippine rodent. Um, we discovered this in, uh, I can't remember the year, but, uh, after, after 2000 when we were uh, investigating the island of, uh, or the uh, 
Mount, Mount Baranau uh, in the central, central portion of Luzon. We subsequently found three other species. So these are things that only occur up in trees. And until we started setting traps up in trees, we had no idea that they existed. Who knows what is else out there that we haven't yet found, but probably a lot. The other big group of endemic Philippine rodents are the worm-eating rats. Okay, um, They actually eat worms. Um, and they arrived also a long time ago in the Philippines, but probably later than the, the cloud rats, the tree rats. There are uh, five different genera of these. There's their arrival, estimated arrival time. Uh, Rinka beans, which is the one that I showed you on my introductory slide, uh, is a very bizarre rodent. Has a very long, elongated snout, <clears throat> very reduced cheek teeth. The molar teeth are very much reduced, really non-functional, and very slender, um, uh, needle-like, forcep-like uh, incisors in the front. Has a diet entirely of worms. Uh, we didn't know that. We caught one by accident. Uh, and we started feeding it things and discovered that they love worms. And once we started baiting traps with worms, we could catch these wherever they were present. Another group closely related to Rinkinis, but looking nothing like them, are the striped rats, uh, crotonies. These are my favorites. I think they're really cool. They've got this sort of racing stripe, uh, pale yellow or even a white stripe that goes down the middle of the back, flanked by two black stripes. Uh, unlike a little hopping rat the way Rinkinis is, um, these guys are more like gophers. They actually burrow underground and they go after worms who live underground. Really cool animals. There, and, and there are the yeah. hypothesis for why the lower incisors are as long as they are on that thing. Yeah. Um, so that they can grab worms. Oh, worms. Yeah, that's yeah. essentially what it is. They're really effective. Um, then there, are, there are things called, we, we call shrew mice, and there are actually two genera of these. One that we discovered um, only after, they look very much alike, and we thought that they were all members of one genus, and then they were coming out in different segments of the tree uh, when we did the genetic work with them and realized that they were convergent on the same body form in the same ecology, but they were actually separate, separate lines on the, on the worm rat. Um, uh, tree. Um, anyway, they're, they're, they're more of a shrew-like diet of insects and things of that sort, not strictly worms. And then the largest, uh, most diverse or most speciose group of, of, of mice in this, in this uh, a worm rat clay uh, really don't look very bizarre. They look kind of like our deer mice. They're beautiful little mice, um, very colorful, and uh, it's, it's a very widespread endemic group and accounts for much of the variation. Uh, okay, so those are the two old endemic clays, and now there's some more recent, recently arrived things that have, that have come into the Philippines that haven't diversified quite as much. Um, these include things mostly that came up from the south through, um, through Mindanao as opposed from, from Luzon. And again, their arrival is, is at different times, a bit later. Um, and uh, at any rate, as near as we can tell, all of the native rodents of the Philippine Islands evolved from five successful colonizations. Five successful colonists and then dozens of different rodents. Now, the other rodents that are in the Philippines, the other animals that are in the Philippines, not native, I need to talk about because they're relevant to conservation. Um, the three on the top are, are the most common and most widespread in the Philippines, the Asian black rat. This is something that's native to Asia and was brought in prehistorically by early settlers in early colonists of the, of the Philippine Islands. Uh, the Polynesian rat is widespread in, in the oceanic region. Again, it arrived prehistorically as did the Asian house shrew. Okay, now the first two, black rat and the Polynesian rat, are severe economic pests. The house shrew is sort of a pest, people sort of tolerate them because they eat cockroaches and things like that in houses. 
The animals on the bottom are other non-native species that have been reported in the Philippines, but they're not very widespread, and they haven't made real inroads into the archipelago. And we'll see maybe why in a little while. Okay, so this is the time now where I'm going to talk about conservation. And the first thing that one is aware of when we're thinking about conservation in the Philippines is the loss of natural habitat. Um, this slide shows in dark green the areas of present forest. In light green, the area of, of forest at the time of the beginning of the American colonial era. As Americans, we don't like to think about the fact that we had a colonial era, but we did. It was a benign colonial era, I guess you could say, uh, in, in general. We did a lot of good for the Philippines, but we also mucked some things up. And an awful lot of the early development that occurred in the Philippines was the exploitation of, of natural habitat, and that was uh, cutting down forests for, for lumber and other things and clearing land for agricultural purposes. Um, there are a number of national parks in the Philippines, but unlike our national parks, they're mostly national parks on paper, or they have been in the past. Mount Dada, the, the place where John Whitehead, that English naturalist, discovered those mammals in 1898, was designated as the first national park in the Philippines. Um, this is the extent of the National Park's forest now. Just uh, 80 hectares of forest in an area that was on a mountaintop, a tabletop mountain that was all forested uh, as recently as, as 1950. Um, the problem is there's been, um, there was this development of, of uh, truck farming for vegetables, um, temperate region best vegetables like carrots and tomatoes and, and cabbages and things like that, which won't grow in the lowlands, but they grow up in these high elevation areas where things are a lot cooler. And uh, the forest has been cut down and these areas have been, have been uh, grown up in agriculture. So the interesting thing about Mount Data National Park or Mount Data is that there have been several mammal surveys done there. The first one was Whiteheads, okay, in, 19, in 1898, and there was one done in, uh, immediately after World War II, and then our group did one in 2006. And we discovered that all of the large animals that were locally present in the earlier surveys have gone extinct, locally extinct, they haven't gone extinct you know, globally, but they're no longer there, they've been extirpated. But many of the small, smaller species are, are still there. So what I'm going to show you now are uh, results of some of the work that we've done surveying mammals across gradients of habitat disturbance. Now, in a situation where the habitat has been so hammered, the natural habitat has been so hammered, it's important to understand two things. One, how the native species respond to habitat disturbance. And secondly, how the native species may be interacting with the non-native species. So these are, this is a, a composite, these, are, these will be composite diagrams of, of uh, work that we've done in, in four areas in the, in the northern uh, central Cordillera. So there are species like Rinkeby sorcoides and some others that are not very tolerant of disturbance. They're either restricted to pristine areas or areas that have only been moderately disturbed. So this gradient runs from intact old growth forest on the left, to various level disturbance to secondary forest and early second growth in the middle, and then to the right areas that have been completely deforested and that are agricultural land generally. So these, there are these species that are restricted to, to uh, relatively pristine areas. But it's not a majority. And even these guys can tolerate some disturbance. There are other species that, can, that are highly tolerant of disturbance, of human disturbance. They include some things like Globius pallidus, the giant, 
giant cloud rats that are, we think are edge species. They actually like a certain amount of natural disturbance. And when that's mimicked by human disturbance, they can tolerate it quite well. Um, it also includes some things we didn't expect. And then these were some of the, the highly specialized ornithine rats, in this case the striped rats, that actually could be more abundant in, in some of these areas um, that are acutely outside of the forest than they are inside of the forest. Um, and we think that they're able to do this because they're exploiting um, very good food resources in the form of non-native earthworms and other kinds of, of uh, soft-bodied invertebrates that they can eat. Then the opposite situation, and you can see that on the bottom right, uh, is seen for the, um, the non-native species. On this, on this, in this area, two species, the two pest rats, uh, the Polynesian rat and the Asian black rat. Um, these things are most abundant in areas that have been completely deforested, human habitat, uh, where there's significant pests on, on rice crops and things of that sort. They're present in old growth order, present in, in, um, in early second growth, sort of weedy habitat that's been fallow for a while. And also, uh, they're, they're found in secondary forests, where the forest is being allowed to regenerate. Um, but these areas are interesting because they represent what's happening in areas that are regenerating and presumably were completely reforested deforested prior to that. Um, in the completely deforested areas, they're, they're, the non-native rats dominate, and a few species of the hardiest uh, native species are present. As soon as the forest can come back as secondary forest, the tables turn, and the non-native species are less dominant uh, than they are in the open area, and uh, the dominant species are actually natives. So, what these gradient studies have shown us is that native species have variable levels of disturbance tolerance. Some of them are relatively intolerant, but many of them are highly tolerant to disturbance, human disturbance. Non-native species are generally restricted to highly disturbed areas. Native species dominate areas with regenerating pores. The conclusions are, the native fauna can tolerate moderate habitat disturbance as a whole. The fauna is resilient in response to habitat regeneration. And the fauna is resistant to disruption by non-native species. Now this is pretty interesting, and it's actually a result that initially we didn't predict would, would, would occur. Because uh, conventional wisdom has a that island faunas are fragile. Uh, if you talk to conservation biologists, if you talk to biogeographers, they think that oceanic islands in particular are very susceptible to disruption by non-native species and don't do well at all under disturbed situations. Clearly that doesn't hold, at least for the big island of, of Luzon in the north, and we think also for some of the other islands in the Philippines. The question is why? And I don't really have a full answer to that, but I think I have a partial answer. And uh, the way I'm going to illustrate this is with a little story about an animal called the Pinatubo volcano mouse. And I like to call it conservation peril because it's a simple story that has broader implications. I think that's what peril is. So here's Avenis Cobianus. Discovered in 1956 based on a single specimen that was collected by David Johnson, who was a curator at the Smithsonian Institution, U.S. National Museum. And he collected it on Clark Air Base, which sits right below Mount Pinatubo. So there it is. There's the airfield uh, cemetery below the mountain. This uh, is the Sokovia River, which runs through Clark Air Base. And all we know about the whole type of this animal is collected along the Sokovia River. All right, in 1991, 
uh, Mount Pinatubo erupted. It was the second most powerful volcanic eruption in the 20th century. The first being a, a, an eruption in Alaska about 1910 or something like that. Um, it really blew its top. This is the Sokovia River uh, right after the eruption. And there were Lahar flows, the pyroclastic flows, and ash and mud uh, that, that were deposited in the stream bed, completely wiped out. This is a satellite image of Mount Pinatubo, showing the crater where the mountain is labeled. Uh, north shows you the direction. So this is from um, west central Luzon. Um, that's the drainage of the Sokovia River, and that's what it looked like, okay, looking from an aerial view. So in 2005, we went to Mount Natib, which is in the Bataan Peninsula. Um, not very far away from Mount Pinatubo, but not within the real blast zone, okay, in the area where, where there was a lot of ash fall. There was a lot of good forest there. It was a place that we wanted to, to survey. And we thought we actually might catch, um, or might be able to document, Avenue Sokovianus. As it turned out, we couldn't. We couldn't find it there. We found a related species that uh, turned out to be a new species. Uh, but it wasn't uh, Avenue Sokovianus. Well, that wasn't good enough for Danny Malate. So this is what uh, Mount Pinatubo looked right after the eruption. This is what it looked like 20 years later right around the crater, okay, which is really what, what blew up, um, there was regenerating second growth habitat. And Danny decided that he would go there with some volunteers and they would see what they could find. Well, in 2011, 20 years after the eruption, they found that Apomis sokovianus was the most common species. It was found in all of the areas where they surveyed for it. And in most places, it was much, uh, much more abundant than the non-native species that were able to move into these areas. Um, so, very clearly, this mouse and many of the other species in the Philippines are adapted to severe natural disturbance. Think about it. Uh, this is an area with volcanoes, it's an area with typhoons, it's an area with earthquakes. Uh, it's it's a, a place where some kind of disaster is going to happen on a regular basis. And these things have seen them, and they've evolved in context with them. We think because of that, they're pre-adapted to human disturbance. Um, now, what does this mean? The conservation outlook in the Philippines at one time was thought to be so dire that no conservation organization would put any money into it. Um, it was written off considered to be a lost cause because only like five or six percent of the natural forested habitat remain. Um, clearly we see a fauna that can adapt to, to disturbance. And in fact, there haven't been, during the historic era, there haven't been, to our knowledge, any extinctions of mammals in the Philippines. Um, this is a very resilient and resistant fauna. And it's one that's more characteristic of a, of a continental region than an island area. So it tells us that our preconceptions about the fragility of island fauna is really not necessarily the truth. And uh, it means that the future may be a bit brighter for Philippine mammals than we originally thought. Uh, thank you very much.